Hello, everyone. My name is Kathy Flynn, and I'm the National Senior Director of Engagement for the American Liver Foundation. The American Liver Foundation is the nation's largest voluntary healthcare organization serving people with liver disease and those who care for them. Since 1976, we have provided a voice for patients and their families through education, support, research, and advocacy. Welcome to the second session in the series of nurse education webinars presented by the Greater New York and New Jersey Medical Advisory Council. This section, session focuses on viral hepatitis B and C. These educational programs were planned by nurses, for nurses, advanced practice nurses, and other healthcare professionals. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Kat Evans, who will be handling the technology for today's webinar. Kat, would you mind sharing um, our disclaimer and a few words about the meeting platform, as well as today's sponsors? Sure thing. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Kathy. Please take a moment to just review this disclaimer, as this webinar is being recorded and will be shared on our YouTube channel. This online educational program is being delivered on the Zoom platform. Today, in order to eliminate background noise, only the speakers, microphones, and cameras are enabled. Everyone else will be muted. For optimum viewing, we ask that everyone be in speaker view. So please expand the view menu in the top right corner and click speaker. During the presentations, if you have a question, please hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen and click on chat. Then simply type your question in the chat box. The speakers will answer questions at the end of the presentations during our Q&A session. All attendees will also receive a link to the video via email for on-demand viewing and sharing after the program. The American Liver Foundation is grateful for the support it received from Biomatrix Specialty Pharmacy, Optopharma USA, and Optum in support of this educational webinar. Let's take a couple of minutes to watch a brief video from our sponsor, and please note that this video does not have any sound. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Diane lapointe Rideau. Diane is a nurse practitioner at the Mount Sinai Hospital and an active member of the American Liver Foundation's Greater New York and New Jersey Medical Advisory Council. Diane, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Kat. Hi, everyone. Welcome today. We're really excited about our program. Today's nurse education program will feature three presentations, followed by a question and answer session. 
The topics include diagnosing and treating patients with hepatitis B, and this will be presented by Dr. Paul Gaglio. Dr. Gaglio is a professor of medicine and surgery and is the director of hepatology outreach at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University, Irvine Medical Center. He is also an active member of the American Liver Foundation's Greater New York and New Jersey, Jersey's Medical Advisory Council. Um, after Dr. Gaglio, we're gonna learn about diagnosing and treating patients with hepatitis C. This will be presented by Damaris Carrero. Ms. Carrero is an assistant clinical professor of nursing at Columbia University School of Nursing, as well as a nurse practitioner at the Center for Liver Disease and Transplantation at New York Presbyterian's Columbia University Irvine Medical Center. And then um, after that, we're going to learn about the nursing interventions that can impact successful outcomes. And Mallory Ionelli is going to give us that talk. She is a registered nurse and she works at the Center for Liver Disease and Transplantation at Weill Corn Cornell Medical Center. Please remember that as the presentations are going on, you can enter questions into the chat box. Um, the speakers will answer these questions at the end of all three presentations. Finally, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Gaglio to give us the talk about hepatitis B. Great. Well, Diane, thank you very much for that really nice introduction. And I'm going to talk about hepatitis B, as you talked about. Um, and let's see if I can make my slides. There we go. So as we're all aware, hepatitis B is a gigantic problem worldwide. And I always like to start my Hep B lectures out by giving this heat map of the world. And everything that's in turquoise or dark blue shows where in the world there's high or intermediate prevalence of hepatitis B. And for those of you who are good at geography, that in general means that most of the world, there's high prevalence of hepatitis B. B. Well, why are, am I giving this lecture when you look at the United States and it looks like the prevalence is actually not that high? Well, the answer is that many, many people living in parts of the world where the prevalence of hepatitis B is very high are immigrating to the United States. And if you actually had a heat map of the U.S., on the east and west coast of the US, you would see a significant amount of hepatitis B. In fact, there's about more than 2 million individuals in the US with Hep B, and more than 95% of those individuals who are foreign born are coming from an area where hepatitis B is endemic. Just for a granular view, for those of you who are used to looking at a map of New York, here's Manhattan, Staten Island, Brooklyn, and Queens. And you can clearly see that the highest rates of hepatitis B in our population are in the parts or neighborhoods with very large Asian populations. Now, the first thing that we need to think about in terms of what we're doing for our Hep B patients is to screen for hepatitis B. And all the major organizations recommend that if you had a person who is born in a region where the prevalence of Hep B is more than intermediate, so more than 2%, or if a, a U.S. born person was not vaccinated as an infant whose parents were born in regions of the world where hepatitis B is high prevalence, they should be screened. Household and sexual contacts of individuals with Hep B also need to be screened because if we identify those individuals, we can vaccinate them to prevent them from getting infected. All pregnant women, and we'll talk about that in detail, men who have sex with men, IV drug users, and obviously anybody with elevated liver tests needs to be assessed for Hep B. Now, one major intervention in terms of understanding Hep B is that there are certain medical conditions where we have to be very attentive to assessing for hepatitis B, and that includes anyone who's going to undergo immunosuppression. And that, in, that includes prednisone, chemotherapy, MABs for inflammatory bowel disease, etc. Anyone undergoing hemodialysis and anybody who's infected with hep C or HIV. I'm not going to bore you with the interpretation or the serologic interpretations, but I do want to point out that your patients with chronic hepatitis B are surface antigen positive and core antibody positive. All of us who've been vaccinated are only surface antibody positive, and individuals who've been exposed to the virus and cleared it are core antibody and surface antibody positive. So in terms of who you're going to treat, we're thinking about that in patients who are surface antigen positive, which is a marker of active viral replication. 
So what do we tell our patients? So you've identified your patient with hepatitis B, how are we gonna counsel them? So the first thing we tell them is we wanna reduce transmission of the virus. So if we find that patient, we wanna identify their family members, their sexual partners and household partners to make sure that they get tested for hepatitis B and vaccinated if they're negative. We should recommend barrier protections if the individual sexual partner has not been vaccinated or the vaccine is not working. We also recommend things like trying to share or not share toothbrushes or razors, cover open cuts and scratches, and clean blood spills with detergent. Now, a really important aspect of preventing hep B transmission is recognizing that in women with very high viral loads, they can easily transmit hepatitis B to their unborn child, even if the child is vaccinated and receives hepatitis B immune globulin. So the new recommendations are, if you've got a mom, she's in her third trimester, and her viral load is over 200,000 international units, or about a million copies, we want to consider treating that mom in the third trimester to prevent hepatitis B transmission. Now, other things to tell the patient, so they've got hepatitis B, we want to avoid anything that's going to cause their liver disease to progress, so we tell them to avoid heavy alcohol use, so I in general recommend, you know, less than two glasses of wine per day in women, uh, less than three beers per day in men, or less than basically minimizing the amount of alcohol use. We want to make sure that in our hepatitis B infected patient, we don't screen them once and then let them go because there are patients with hepatitis B, when you initially see them, their viral loads may be undetectable and their ALTs may be normal. However, that virus may progress. They may become active replicators and their ALTs ALTs may change. So these hep B patients need chronic surveillance. We want to tell them to stop smoking. As we're all aware, cigarette smoking can advance hepatic fibrosis, monitoring for liver cancer, and of course, to watch out for the combination of fatty liver disease and hepatitis B. Remember that Asian patients at lower BMIs, so any BMI over 24, which would be considered a normal BMI in a non-Asian patient, is actually an abnormal normal BMI, and many of my Asian patients who are 10, 15 pounds above their best ideal body weight who have hep B also have fatty liver disease, so we have to be careful about that combination. Now, what are we going to do in terms of the initial evaluation? So we found our patient with hep B. We want to assess their hepatitis A status and vaccinate them if their hep A is negative. It's a disaster for someone with chronic liver disease to get acutely infected with hepatitis A. And if we could prevent it with vaccination, that's the best way to do it. We want to check for any co-infection with hep C. We want to also look for Delta virus. And it's important to remember that within the next six months, new therapies for hepatitis D or Delta are going to be FDA approved. We want to check for HIV infection and we want to minimize alcohol abuse. We want to also assess family history. Very important to remember that in a patient with hep B who doesn't have traditional indications for therapy, if they have a family member with liver cancer or family members with cirrhosis, I would think twice and think about treating those patients even if they don't fit traditional guidelines. We want to look to see what the patient's hepatitis that is B viral load is. We'll talk about guidelines. And importantly, we want to assess their liver status, specifically how much fibrosis they have. So we can do that easily with easily uh, available lab tests. So the AST to platelet ratio index, Fib4, Fibrosure, which is a blood test that we can use, and some type of radiologic assessment, either ultrasound with elastography, vibration control transient elastography, or MR elastography. Because of course, more fibrosis equals more disease. The more fibrosis the patient has, the more at risk they are to develop liver cancer, decompensation, etc. So it's all about looking at surface antigen and viral load, which we'll talk about in detail. So when you think about hepatitis B, there are very clear-cut cases in which you say, I am not going to delay therapy. I'm going to put that patient on therapy now. So if the patient has life-threatening liver disease, like they have acute liver failure from hepatitis B, they have decompensated cirrhosis, and they're actively replicating hepatitis B. They received a chemotherapeutic agent, and they reactivated their hepatitis B. All of those patients need to be treated. Anybody with cirrhosis and any detectable hep 
B viral load should be treated. Surface antigen positive patients and others who are starting immunosuppressive therapy, and we'll explain that in a second, need to be evaluated for therapy. And the classic way to look at it is if you've got a viral load over 2,000 international units and you have an abnormal ALT, those patients should be considered for therapy. And we already talked about treating pregnant women in their third trimester if they have a viral load that's higher than 200,000 international units. So if we make a decision to treat patients, we have several treatments that are available. So interferons, not used so often in general, potentially in someone who's got genotype A, hepatitis B, but the medications that we generally use are oral agents like entecavir, tenofovir, either viriat or vemlity. So how do we know that our patient is responding to therapy? Well, we know our patient's responding to therapy by several parameters. So the first, is the patient's viral load undetectable? The second, did they lose their E antigen? And then finally, did they lose their surface antigen and become surface antibody positive? Unfortunately, this does not occur so often. Other parameters of success. Now, not only is the viral load undetectable, but is that patient's ALT now normal? And then finally, is their fibrosis improving? And we know that in long-term treated patients whose viral loads are undetectable and individuals whose liver tests are normal, they will develop improved histologic response. Their fibrosis will improve over time. So how do we monitor these patients while they're on therapy? So if they're receiving interferon, we have to look out for anemia. While patients are on therapy with any hep B therapy, we want to make sure that their AST, ALT, bilirubins, GGTs are normalizing. Creatinine, important to assess because some hep B therapy has been associated with evidence of renal dysfunction, particularly adefavir and tenofovir dysperoxyl fumarate. So if you've got a patient on adefavir or viriad, we want to follow those patients' renal function carefully. We want to check their viral loads, make sure that they're becoming undetectable, and if they're on interferon, we have to watch out for other side effects like flu uh, symptoms and fatigue. Now, what about testing for HIV? Very importantly, many HIV-infected patients are co-infected with Hep B, and Hep B-infected patients are co-infected with HIV. And it used to be easy to treat these patients because most HIV medication used to have very potent Hep B coverage like tenofovir. You must know that there's a movement in the HIV world to now, instead of using very appropriate and potent Hep B therapies, some of these combination HIV regimens don't have the world's best Hep B coverage. So we want to be careful in our HIV infected patients to check for Hep B and make sure that they're getting some tenofovir containing regimen that's going to protect them from reactivating their Hep B. So one thing to always think about as well is to survey for liver cancer. And I, in general, am very conservative. I've seen too many young patients without cirrhosis develop liver cancer. So in my Hep B patients, if they're Asian American or if they're not Asian American, I do ultrasound with alpha feeder protein every six months. And if there's something of concern on the ultrasound, I recommend MRI to assess these patients. So it really makes sense to remember that in patients with hepatitis B, they are at risk of developing evidence of liver cancer, and we need to follow them carefully. So let's look at some cases and decide what we're going to do. So there's a 23-year-old woman from Nigeria. She's got long-standing hepatitis B. Her E antigen is positive. Her HPV DNA is over 100 million, and you can clearly see that I'm bad at math here, so there should be an extra zero. But she's got a high viral load, but a normal ALT. She's got no liver fibrosis. She's never been treated. So mom does not have indications in her for hep B therapy, but as her viral load is dramatically high, over 100 million international units or clearly over 200,000 international units, she should be managed. So what are we going to do and what are the recommendations? So she's going to start tenofovir at 26 weeks of gestation. She delivers a healthy hep B free baby. The baby gets hep B immune globulin plus hep B vaccination. So as we talked about, mom's viral load over 200,000 international units. She should be treated in the second or third trimester to try to prevent 
the transmission of hep B to their unborn child. Now, the question that comes up, should you continue tenofovir? And the answer is, if mom meets criteria for therapy, yes. If mom does not, there's no indication to continue tenofovir. You can discontinue it. Other question, should mom be allowed to breastfeed her child? Yes, if she's on tenofovir and it has not been studied with entecovir. Next patient, and this comes up all the time, 18-year-old woman presents for evaluation for hep B. She was born in Vietnam, came to the United States at age five after adoption. Her viral load is very high, 170 million international units. She's surface antigen positive, E antigen positive with a normal ALT. She's got no family history of liver cancer or cirrhosis. She's genotype A, has no evidence of any kind of factors that would be associated with greater rates of, of requirement for hep B therapy. But she's actively replicating. Will this impact her plans for a career in healthcare? So this is a question that comes up all the time. And one guidance is from the European Association for the Study of Liver Disease, where the guidelines say that if you're a healthcare worker who's doing an exposure-prone procedure, and that includes anything with a needle and anything with a scalpel, we have to be careful about transmitting hepatitis B, and it's recommended that hep B surface antigen positive patients with active replication over 200 international units um, should receive some potent nucleoside to try to prevent them from replicating. And in surgeons, monitoring for compliance and efficacy is required. So this is a really important concept in our healthcare workers who are actively replicating hep B. Now, the final example this is a 65-year-old Japanese man with hep B. He wants to get your opinion about what to do about his hep B exposure. He was recently diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and he's about to get CHOP, so cytoxan plus rituximab plus high-dose prednisone. So he's core antibody positive, surface antigen negative. His ALT is normal. His ultrasound's normal. Should we prophylax him? And if we're not, how should we monitor him? So one important concept is the reactivation of hep B in the setting of receiving any depleting agent, chemotherapy agent, etc. So this is a website that I use all the time. It's hepatitis.va.gov. So when you go to the website and you put in what medication they're about to receive. So in this example, our patient's getting rituximab and high-dose prednisone. And then when you put that information in, you look, and are they surface antigen negative, core antibody positive, or surface antigen positive, core antibody positive? And if they're getting a B-cell depleting agent, you need to prophylax them, even if they're surface antigen negative. If they're getting high-dose steroids, you need to prophylax them because when these patients start replicating hep B because they reactivate, they can get very, very sick and develop evidence of significant issues. So you'll notice that for patients who are surface antigen positive, core antibody positive, or surface antigen negative, with standard steroids, immunosuppression, et cetera, you don't have to prophylax them. But if they're getting high dose steroids, immunosuppression, et cetera, be very careful. So to summarize, we want to screen for hep B in our at-risk individuals. Consider therapy if the viral load is over 2,000 international units, even if the liver tests are normal in the setting of advanced fibrosis, family history of liver cancer, or potentially as somebody with genotype B or C. Definite therapy, viral load over 2,000 international units, abnormal ALT, cirrhosis, third trimester of pregnancy. We want to watch out for reactivation, particularly in patients who are going to get chemotherapy, infliximabs, et cetera, and we want to screen for liver cancer. And I thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaglio. That was a lot of information, but it was really clearly presented. We appreciate that. Um, next, I'm going to turn it over to Damaris, um, and Damaris is going to talk about hepatitis C. If anyone has any questions for her as she's speaking, please feel free to put it in the chat box and we'll address it at the end of all of the, the seminars. Thank you, Diane. So next, uh, Kat, these are my disclosures. So what are we talking about next? So hep C, flavivirus, I'm going to go pretty quickly because I have a uh, definite uh, number of slides here. So it's the things to remember, single-stranded RNA, it's um, related or, or similar to uh, the dengue virus, West Nile, Zika. It's uh, heterogeneous. In other words, the, uh, the driving enzyme uh, makes many mistakes. That creates a lot of viral diversity. And um, 
that makes it escape the immune system medications. It's very hard to uh, develop a vaccine. There are six genotypes distributed globally and uh, more than 15 subtypes. Next, what are the numbers? So uh, prevalence of hep C in this country at incidents mostly from in the past from NHANES. The most recent CDC data estimates that about two, we have 2.4 million individuals with active hep C infection. Importantly to remember that about 50% of people infected in this country are not aware that they have hep C. All right, in uh, 2013, uh, the data showed that more deaths occurred from hep C and related complications than 60 infectious diseases combined and reported to the CDC. Next. The HCV trends we are experiencing in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, a growth and increase in the incidence of acute hep C, and that's in tandem with increasing uh, acute hep C infections related to the opioid epidemic. All right, as you can see, uh, these new acute infections are affecting the younger population. Uh, the burden of disease in the past has, or still is, but we have usually described as hep C affecting uh, older populations. Now in the last 10, 15 years, this is, um, this is what we've seen. And again, this is all fueled by the opioid epidemic. Next. Okay, what is the disease process? All right, so early, uh, early uh, history, the, um, the patient becomes viremic within days to a month after exposure and uh, liver enzymes AST, ALT transaminases can rise concomitantly. Um, the, they develop antibody within three months, about 15 to 25% of uh, individuals will clear virus spontaneously. The rest, 75 to 85% per of uh, individuals uh, develop chronic infection. Next. And how does hep C progress? So progression, to cirrhosis uh, occurs in about 20% of individuals. Uh, it's affected by older age, obesity, immune suppression, obviously, and uh, alcohol use, excess alcohol use. All right, it is, hep C is one of the leading causes of liver cancer and liver transplant and death in this country. Next, these are the factors that can uh, affect rapid disease progression. There are non-modifiable host factors, so male sex, um, older age at time of infection, inflammation, uh, immune suppression, those things we can't control. The things we can control, obviously, alcohol consumption, obesity, metabolic uh, comorbidities, try to um, strictly control those. Uh, that that uh, affects progression. And then finally, genotype three, um, Hep C is associated with hepatic steatosis and co-infection with HIV, hep B, or both. Okay, hep C has been associated with multiple extrahepatic manifestations, the most common cryoglobulinemia, autoimmune disorders, uh, and some cutaneous uh, conditions, uh, PCT and lichen planus, some kidney disorders, and it has um, an association with uh, B cell non Hodgkin lymphoma as well. So, who's at risk? Okay, so uh, the data is mostly cohort individuals born between 1945 and 1965, baby boomers. Uh, they, they have the, great, uh, the highest prevalence in this country among patients infected with Hep C. And they also have the, the, uh, the more severe burden of disease. Okay, they're, they're six times more likely to be infected than adults uh, born in other, um, in other years. 
They were also at great risk for liver cancer and other hep C related diseases. Significantly, African Americans um, have higher rates of complications and, uh, and deaths compared to other ethnic groups. Next. Okay, people who, uh, persons who inject drugs. So, um, these account for the greatest increases in infection in the United States in the last 10, 15 years. All right, again, tied to the, the infections are tied to the opioid epidemic, all right? And they, it's uh, disproportionately impacting those living in non-urban areas, uh, young white individuals and people who are uh, disassociated with medical care, all right? Next. Other people at increased risk, obviously, uh, again, current or former injection drug users, people who uh, received um, blood products or clotting products before 1987, hemophiliacs, uh, people who were transfused or received uh, an organ uh, prior to 1992 when we started to screen the blood supply, uh, patients on chronic dialysis, uh, people with HIV infection, and children born to mothers with hep C. Screening and identification. So uh, despite the fact that the available uh, regimens, the DAAs, direct acting antivirals, have greater than a 95% um, efficacy and cure rate, we still are lagging behind. Only fewer than 25% of individuals have been treated in this country. So there is a gap in screening and final linkage to care. Next. So the, the, uh, the associations, the IDSA, the um, Infectious Disease Society of America, the ASLD, and also the American Society of Addiction Medicine have issued their guidelines and recommendations for for testing and uh, for providing care and counseling. So obviously they're, they're, uh, they're recommending that all persons with a history of drug use uh, be tested at least once. And if it's ongoing, their risk is ongoing, then they need to be tested at regular interval, inter intervals. Um, they should be offered uh, immunizations, vaccines, if not immune already, hepatitis A and B in active drug users, obviously seasonal influenza and pneumococcal in patients with cirrhosis as well. Uh, they need to be tested for concomitant or co-infection with HIV and hep B. And, uh, and the clinical staff, again, should be uh, trained to provide uh, proper uh, counseling for patients regarding transmission and clinical course and treatment options. Next. Again, this is the ASLD IDSA HCV screening recommendations. They, they overlap pretty much the same. They have a one-time one -time, uh, voluntary uh, recommended testing for all persons 18 years of under or, or, uh, or over. Anybody under with uh, existing risk also needs to be tested prenatal testing, and uh, again, periodic testing for anybody with ongoing risk, annual testing for, uh, for people with HIV, men who have unprotected sex with men, especially men who are infected with HIV. Next. This is a recommended testing sequence. And again, as Dr. Gaglio said, I don't want to bore you, but this basically outlines uh, how we, yeah, we um, interpret these tests. If you have a negative antibody test, uh, nothing else should be done except if you've been exposed in the last three months, then you should either get a PCR or repeat an antibody test in three months. If you have a positive antibody test, you go on to get a hep C RNA or PCR. Sometimes these things um, come as one it, uh, it skips a step, so the antibody test comes with reflex to PCR. Uh, if that's reactive and, um, and the PCR is negative, again, that's probably somebody who either cleared the virus on his or her own or was treated. If they are detected, PCR detected, then you have active in, uh, infection, okay? Management and counseling, again, refer for medical evaluation, usually 
of primary care, infectious disease, gastro or hepatologist. You have to counsel uh, uh, alcohol and, um, and uh, alcohol uh, avoidance and, uh, and screen for any medications they might be on that might interfere eventually with potential therapy. You have to test for co-infection with HIV and Hep B. You need to counsel pe people for uh, weight management and um, Hep A, Hep B vaccinations of non-immune. Non and again, pneumococcal for anybody with cirrhosis. Okay, who receives treatment? So treatment is recommended for all patients with chronic Hep C, except those with short life expectancy that cannot be remediated by Hep C therapy, transplant, or another directed therapy. Next. And what are the goals of uh, antiviral therapy? Hep C eradication, obviously improve liver-related health outcomes and reduce transmission as a public health. This is, this is an old slide, but I just want to um, stress, this is um, uh, data that show improvement in all liver-related um, mor morbidity and mortality, the development of cancer, uh, and end stage liver disease for patients who were treated with interferon based regimens years ago. And they were followed for over eight and a half, no, a little less than eight and a half years. These were patients in Canada and Europe. And basically, the, uh, they had significant, uh, th their outcomes were significantly better than those who didn't uh, achieve a cure. All right, so pre treatment assessment. So you've got cirrhosis, you, a cirrhosis assessment, it's really to rule out cirrhosis. We very rarely send anybody for a liver biopsy, anybody who has hepatitis C. We have um, excellent way to at least estimate uh, damage with uh, uh, non-invasive uh, serum markers. We can calculate FIB4 just with your normal chemistry and CBC, APRI, and uh, and of course you have elastography, uh, which um, Dr. Gaglio had mentioned before. Okay, and we have a guide as well to tell us if a patient is cirrhotic, somebody who's got, who has platelets under 150,000, whose fibro scan liver uh, score is, uh, liver stiffness is greater than 12.5, so. All right, and again, la recommended laboratory testing, important, I can't stress enough, before initiating um, DAA therapy, we need to assess for Hep B co-infection, obviously, and HIV. What, um, it has been reported, obviously, we all know Hep B reactivation has been reported, few and far between, but has been reported on these potent uh, DAAs. So these are the recommended regimens for treatment-naive patients without cirrhosis. Uh, you'll notice that the last two, sofosbuviral patosphere or brand name Eclusa, and uh, Glecaprovir and Fibrentisvir or GP brand name Maverick. They cover all genotypes, they're pan-genotypic, and they're actually the drugs we use most to uh, treat hep C now. Okay, um, I mentioned drug-drug interactions. There are plenty of, um, not plenty, but certainly we, we have a a few very good uh, uh, databases to um, to uh, uh, to look for drug drug interactions. I use Liverpool. I use Up to Date as well, and um, and that's that. That's very so. Conclusions: Hep C is a major cause of morbidity and mortality. There is an increased incidence of new Hep C infections fueled by the op opioid uh, epidemic. Hep C testing is essential if you're going to uh, identify patients with Hep C. Um, most individuals, including those with active substance uh, use disorder, are candidates for treatment, and direct acting antivirals are safe and highly efficacious. So, I, these are the online resources I just added for everyone. And if I have time, I can do one patient case. Uh, this is a gentleman I saw in one of our outreach clinics. Uh, he's a 66-year-old Turkish male diagnosed with hep C in the fall of 2020 on routine screening by his primary physician. 
Uh, he reports iatrogenic exposure as a boy in Turkey. He sustained a deep leg wound requiring debriding and intensive wound care. His medical history, he's an active um, tobacco user, a pack per day. He's obese, has COPD, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. He has no other surgeries. He denies any injection drug use or recreational drug use. He has no tattoos, no body piercing, piercing and no history of blood donation. He, he reports very rare alcohol use. He doesn't take any herbal or OTC supplements. His family, oops, his family history is notable for um, colorectal in his mom and prostate cancer in his dad. His only medications are inhalers, pro, pro air and Sempacort. Okay. His physical exam only notable for xanthomas on the eyelids and truncal obesity. Um, his initial lab, he came in with uh, labs from his primary robust platelet count. His uh, kidney is normal. Um, his synthetic liver function is normal. His transaminase, transaminases are moderately elevated. He has some mild cholesterol elevation and triglycerides. He's a borderline um, diabetic, 5.6. Uh, and I calculated obviously a Fib4 and an APRI, and which showed that he probably has a moderate risk of some fibro, significant fibrosis. So I ordered a NASH fibrosure and Hep C fibrosure that again confirmed an F3 bridging fibrosis, a steatosis grade uh, with moderate steatosis, and a uh, necroinflammatory score of severe activity as far as the HCV. He's a genotype 2B. His viral load is under five logs, AFP of nine. He is, uh, he's never been exposed to hep B, surface antibody non-reactive, core and, um, uh, and surface antigen negative. He is immune to hep A. His ultrasound uh, showed cholelithiasis, but otherwise was normal. These are the recommended regimens for treatment of genotype 2, again, the same with or without cirrhosis, you have GP Maverick for eight weeks or Eclusa for 12. So the assessment, a 66 year old active smoker with COPD, obesity, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia, recently diagnosed with hep C, presumed longstanding. Uh, his liver synthetic function is preserved uh, and he has no clinical stigmata of advanced disease, but um, his markers, his, his non-invasive markers indicate the active inflammation. So the plan is to treat with Eclusa versus Maverick, and that's pending insurance, uh, on treatment and post-treatment lab monitoring. Um, I will order elastography once he's done with therapy. Uh, I will recommend surveillance at least Q6 to 12 months with ultrasound. And uh, I also okay treatment with statin if necessary, if deemed necessary by his primary. So in the council, dis you know, discuss ways to reduce liver disease progression, obviously strict control of his hyperlipidemia, his hypertension, weight, weight loss, and most importantly, smoking cessation since there is an association between tobacco and HCC and certainly recommend hep B vaccination. That's all, folks. Thanks so, thanks so much, Damaris. That was great. So now we're going to move on, and um, we're going to ask Mallory to talk to us about nursing interventions that can improve outcomes. Um, Mallory? Hello. Hi, I'm Mallory. I'm going to talk about nursing interventions that impact success successful outcomes in hepatitis B and C. Um, Okay, there we go. Next slide, please. Okay, so Main, the main nursing interventions to have successful outcomes in hepatitis B and C is getting the medication approved. Um, insurance coverage can sometimes be an issue and it's important to get the, the recommended medication 
approved with the insurance. Um, once it's approved, um, before the patient starts treatment, um, a teaching visit should be implemented by, by the nurse or the a clinician. Um, just to go over the correct administration, like um, potential side effects, um, drug interactions need to be reviewed and uh, medication compliance adherence is, is the most important um, for both hepatitis B and C. And then um, last would be follow-up. Patients need to know like pre and post treatment, what follow-up is recommended. Um, so as Dr. Gaglio and D Damaris went over, I just listed some common um, medications that are prescribed for hepatitis B and C. Um, most common for hepatitis B is Vemlidi, um, Variad and Tecavir, and then hepatitis C. Um, the the pan genotypic medications are Abclusa, Maverit, Vosevi, and then other medications for certain genotypes are Harvoni and, and Zepatir. But these are the common ones that um, nurses need to get um, approved by insurances. Um, so first I'm gonna go into hepatitis B. Um, okay, so prior authorization. Prior authorization, it's, it's important to, to complete the correct way. You need the correct clinical information to submit to the insurance in order to get it approved. Um, if if the, the prior authorization is incomplete and, the, and there's missing information, many times the, the prior authorization can get denied and then that results in having to appeal for the medication, which, which ultimately delays patients starting medication. So it really is important for someone with like clinical knowledge to, to complete the prior authorization. Um, prior authorizations, they can be completed electronically through Cover My Meds um, in, or an insurance form, like the insurance will fax you a form and you, you complete it um, and then you could fax it back or you could do it verbally on the phone. Um, so required clinical documents that typic that insurance typically require um, are, is blood work. So for hepatitis B, they require hepatitis B viral load, liver enzymes, um, kidney function, I also find it helpful to have the the office note from the provider indicating the provider indicating that they are recommending treatment for the patient, um, and then also um, like a fibrosis that the, their stage of fibrosis. So whether it's a fibro scan, an MR elastography, a fibro shore, just something showing their fibro their stage of fibrosis stage of fibrosis. Um, Next is specialty pharmacies with prior authorizations um, and, and hepatitis B and C drugs. It's important to have a relationship with a, like a local specialty pharmacy um, because they, they work with us to, to complete the prior authorization. Um, they follow up on it. They, they also work with us to do appeals, which, which is very could be time consuming. Um, they contact the patient directly. Um, if it pay, sometimes patients are restricted to use certain specialty pharmacies like a Credo, Briova, um, and then that pharmacy will have to fill the medication. But but other times that like the local pharmacy that you have the relationship with, they could fill the medication, um, and they're very good with contacting the patient monthly to to schedule delivery of the medication. So there's no delays in treatment. Um, and then and then lastly with the peels. So so from my experience more recently. Um, Vemlidi is the preferred medication for hepatitis B treatment over Viriad. Um, it has less um, long-term side effects on, on the kidneys and bone. So it is, Vemlidi is preferred over Viriad, but many insurance companies currently prefer Viriad. So with my experience, if a patient has low vitamin D, it's, it's good clinical support to use in your appeal that that's why they're, they're a better candidate for Vemlidi because they already have bone loss. And um, it, it just like, it really gets the, the appeal approved most of the time if they do have low vitamin D. Next slide, please. Um, so financial assistance with hepatitis B. So the pharmaceutical company Gilead, they, they have, they have two, two options. They have an option for, one is a financial assistance for high copays. If the medication is approved through the insurance, many times the copay is very high. So they do have um, a Vemlidi copay card that patients can use or the provider just gives to the pharmacy. You just have to give the information on the card. I have the card here on the, the right bottom hand corner. 
Um, and usually the copay is it's it, the most it's usually like $5 per month. So it is very helpful using the Vemlitic um, copay card. Um, and then other times, um, if a patient does not have insurance, Gilead also, if, if the patient qualifies for their patient assistance program, they will provide free um, Vemlity or this is a less commonly used medication for hepatitis B, but they also provide free Hepsera. Um, but you do have to qualify. Usually you have to have a low annual income, but I listed here on the, the left side, the form for the patient assistance program. So this is an option if they don't have insurance um, to get them Vemlity or Hepsera to treat their hepatitis B. Um, next is hepatitis B medication teaching and follow up. This it's pretty straightforward and not as complex as the hepatitis C. But as so before they start medication, you know you would call them and say the medication is approved, and you would go over medication administration and and go over like what drug they're taking, the duration, dose, route, the route, frequency, and time. I. I always stress to them that it, it typically hepatitis B treatment typically is long-term therapy, um, unless th that they they do have zero conversion in the future. Um, but I I stress the importance of having to take the medication every single day, and that they can't just stop taking it. And I I do tell them that there is risk of hepatitis B flare, which can be be dangerous if they do have a flare. And you know I just find it important to stress that to them that they can't just stop taking the medication. Um, and I also go over outcomes of therapy that the goal is to have a, a not, an undetected viral, uh, undetected viral load. Um, and also like after the medication teaching, I go over follow-up. So the, the hepatologist that I work with, typically they recommend to, to get blood work um, three months after starting treatment. I, I There's a typo that I put three weeks, but it's usually three months after treatment. It's, it's the provider's preference, but um, you know, we find that three months is fine for follow-up. And then it's usually just like the standard recommendation after that of getting blood work um, every six months with their uh, abdominal ultrasound for HCC screening. But it's just, I, I think it's important to go over our medication administration, compliance and follow-up before they, they start the medication. Um, next, I'm gonna go into hepatitis C. Um, so before, so when a patient comes in and they, they're, they're interested in, in hepatitis C treatment, I, I always go, like at the initial visit, I always go over the, like the goals of therapy that the goal is to achieve a sustained viral response, um, which, which is cure. Um, I think that's very motivational for patients to hear that there actually is a cure now for their hepatitis C. So, so they, they are more motivated and compliant that they do have a great chance of cure if, if they just follow instructions and recommendations. Also, if they have fibrosis, I, I tell them that if, you, if you're cured of hepatitis C, it prevents further progression of fibros further fibrosis progression. And then in cirrhotic patients, you know, sometimes they think if their hepatitis C is cured, they don't need to follow up. But I, I always tell them that the hepatitis C is cured, but you still have to follow up on your cirrhosis. But, but with cure, you have a less chance of getting hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, and then key factors to increase successful treatment outcomes, like I said, patient com uh, medication compliance. Um, patients need to understand the risk of treatment failure and resistance. Um, I'll go over that more in, in the teaching, but I, I, I let them, I educate them on resistance if they start forgetting to take the medication that the medication might not work because there, there'll be viral resistance. And another important factor is patient support. Many patients are scared to start hepatitis C treatment, um, more so the, the treatment experience patients because they had bad um, side effects with medic old medications like interferon. So I, I always stress that that we as healthcare providers are will are there for or support during and post treatment. Uh, okay, so hepatitis C insurance coverage. So. So prior authorization for hepatitis C is more complex than hepatitis B because of the expense. They're very expensive medications. Um, 
they the the authorization process can be com complex and timely. And, and as I said, with hepatitis B, that's why it's important to know what clinical information the insurance is looking for um, and to, to make sure you provi provide all the correct information. Um, I'm not gonna go over this again, but you could be completed electronically through a form or, or verbally with the insurance. Um, requ required clinical documents as far as blood work, insurances usually re require more recent blood work. It needs to be within at least uh, three months to, to a max of six months. Um, they, they look for a hepatitis C genotype, uh, a viral load, liver enzymes, kidney function, um, they also want to know the stage of fibrosis. And again, an, an office note is always helpful, the provider indicating that they are recommend, recommending um, hepatitis C treatment. And then a spe specialty pharmacy there, they are very important with hepatitis C medications, because again, they, they help with the prior authorization, they contact the patient directly, and they're very good with scheduling delivery of the medication every month, which is very important because you can't, you can't miss any doses with hepatitis C treatment. Um, so they are very helpful and useful and having a relationship with, with at least one specialty pharmacy, it, I, I find it very helpful. Um, in hepatitis C, there, they, there are some pharmaceutical companies such as Abby and Gilead that provide patient assistance programs. Um, usually it's so, so for Maverick, Abby, Abby, offer, Abby offers the patient assistance program. They provide free drug if, if you do qualify. Um, and so does Gilead. They provide for Harvoni, Abclusa, and Vosevi. And, it, and it's, it's the same thing as the patient assistance program with hepatitis B. You, have to ha you either have to have no insurance or a low annual income to qualify, but it's always an option for patients that don't have um, insurance to get them hepatitis C treatment. Um, hepatitis C medication teaching. This is very important. Um, taking the medication, it, it's very straightforward, but educating the patient on how to take it, when to take it, and how long they need to take it is important for successful outcomes. So uh, for nursing assessment, I, I first, before I even do the teaching, I assess their, the patient's level of education. It's, that's important because they, it, it helps us decide whether the, the teach medication teaching should be in person as a visit or it could be done virtually through a video visit or through through a phone call because if they need if their level of education is more like not as advanced they need they would need a face-to-face -face visit to have better understanding of the medication instructions. Um, also with experience, I think it's important to know their, their residency status, um, example, like patients that are homeless. Um, we've had, I've, I've ran into situations where like the medication got delivered to a shelter and the medication was nowhere to be found. So for patients in, in that category, I, I think it's best to get the medication delivered to the, 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 our, our doctor's office. And then the patient has to come in monthly to pick up the medication. This way there's no issues with the medication be being lost or, you know, it's not delivered to the right location. Um, after those two assessments are done, I, I do go into, the, go into medication administration. So typically, um, the duration of treatment, it, it's usually eight to 12 weeks in the, the non-serotic patients. Um, so I do stress that to patients that it's short term, you only need to take this medication for eight to 12 weeks. And if you take it the right way every day, you, you usually have a greater than 97% chance of being cured. Um, so I do stress that. I think that's important for patients to know. It, it helps them to stay motivated and compliant. I also go over um, if they need to take it with or without food, how many tablets a day, they can't crush or split the tablets, it should be, they should be stored at room temperature. Um, and again, medication compliance is very important. I always tell them the goal is not to miss any doses. You have to take it at the same time every day. Um, I suggest reminders for them. They should mark it on the calendar, have a pill box, set an alarm, just something to give them a daily reminder to take it every day. Um, also, they shouldn't double up on doses. That's prohibited. I, I go over that with them. 
Um, and again, like patient motivation, I, I tell them about the cure rate if they're compliant, like the risks of non-compliance, viral resistance, um, and just the outcomes of therapy um, with cure and uh, less risk of fibrosis progression and less risk of developing HCC for cirrhotics. Um, this is important. Potential side effects is important to go over with them. Um, I always stress that it's mild to moderate, um, and usually short term, and really the three main side effects with um, the most, the more commonly prescribed DAAs are headache, fatigue, and nausea. Um, I do give them recommendations of how to manage the side effects. Um, Usually headache is the most commonly one that I see, and it's just really managed with Tylenol if needed, no more than 2000 milligrams in 24 hours. Um, a lot of patients complain of fatigue. So I, I tell them in the beginning, you know, if you want to try to avoid that potential side effect, you could take the dose in the evening, but really it's a matter of remembering to take, take it. You should take it at the time of day that where you're going to remember to take it every single day. Um, as D Damaris went over drug interactions, I'll just briefly um, go over them. So before a patient would join the teaching visit, I will review their current medications with them. Um, many times they do take over the counter like acid reducers, such as like Prilosec, Omeprazole, and they do forget to mention it since it's an over the counter medication. Um, acid reducers do do many times interact with the DAA. So I always ask them, even if they don't mention that they're taking an acid reducer, if they're, if they are taking it, um, many times they will say, yes, I am. Like I forgot to mention it. So that's important because acid reducers can, um, decrease the, it can de decrease the way a DAA works and it, do it doesn't work, um, as well with an acid reducer. Um, also the patients need to know that they need to contact us as healthcare providers before they start any new medications, whether they're sick and they, they need to start, um, a prescribed medication or they want to take something over the counter. They do need to get our approval. So we could just check for drug interactions. And I, I use drug interaction tools. Um, I use the Liverpool, um, hepatology interaction one, as Damaris mentioned. And then I, I also like LexiComp. I think that's a good, um, DDI tool. Um, and then lastly, follow-up. Follow-up's important. Um, it helps with compliance, joint treatment, really all patients starting hepatitis C treatment, they should come in for, they should get blood work four weeks into taking the medication. Um, you know, I, I tell patients join the, join the teaching that usually your viral load is very low or it, it possibly will be not detected by week four. So, you know, patients will come in, get the blood work at week four and it's motivational because they'll see that the medication's working and their virus is suppressing and it, it's almost not detected or it is undetected. Um, with my hepatologist, they also recommend labs at the end of treatment. And then um, I always review post-treatment that we cannot confirm you're officially cured until your viral load is still not detected um, 12 weeks post-treatment. Um, that's important that, that, um, that they know that so they do follow up and we can actually confirm that they were cured 12 weeks post-treatment. Um, and then I always, you know, go over long-term follow-up with them and more, most importantly in the advanced, um, fibrotic cirrhotic patients because of the, the recommended guidelines of HCC screening every six months and varicy screenings every, um, every two years. Um, and that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mallory. That was great. Um, it's funny because your colleague, Alyssa, has been um, kind of your secretary while you're speaking, and she was answering a question on the, oh, great. On the chat. Very closely together. <laughs> But, um, but, but Kristen is actually from Arizona and she brought up a really good point. Um, she wanted to know if um, you do anything special at the end of treatment um, for successes, perhaps a goodie bag or any handouts, kind of a, a way to celebrate because she's a new program and she has a very challenging population. And so she was trying to advocate for, for this group um, as a nurse and um, try to do 
get put some resources together and she was thinking about whether she should give out toothbrushes or condoms or or some information so um i know that you don't really do that on a routine basis but i wonder what your thoughts about things like that are so i do think that's a good idea it, you know it's a, they they do deserve something at the end just for motivation it, it is it is something that they did accomplish um i think like a goodie bag with like ra razors toothbrush is like a nice gift to give them. I know like before COVID when, when they would come in and it was their post-treatment week 12 visit that we would confirm that they're cured. We would give them, um, Dr. Brown, Robert Brown had these pamphlets and a sticker inside that said like, I am now cured. I, I know patients really liked having that, um, pamphlet and sticker and it, it's, it is necessary, you know, for them to know that they're cured because in the future, if another doctor, d d um, tests their, hepatitis um, C antibody and they're positive, like they need to know that they'll always have a positive antibody, even if they, they are cured. So that all that kind of information was in, is in that pamphlet that we do give to patients. Um, but I do think that the goodie bag with like a, having razors and um, um, con like condoms, toothbrushes, I, I do think that that's a, a good like end of treatment um, gesture to give to them. Great, thank you. Um, you know, we are running out of time, so I'm just going to ask a few of these questions, and then the rest of them we will definitely email the answers to you so that you get the answers you need. But Dr. Gaglio, um, somebody wanted to know that if a patient um, is compliant with hepatitis B medications, what is the probability of them developing cirrhosis or HCC? Yeah, so that's a complicated question, and it's probably determined by how much fibrosis they have. So if a patient starts out with advanced fibrosis, even if they become undetectable and their fibrosis improves, there is the possibility that those patients develop liver cancer. But the thing about hepatitis B that I was taught that I'm going to hopefully teach all of you is to never trust the virus. You name the serologies. I've seen surface antigen negative patients who are actively replicating virus. I've seen patients with F0 fibrosis develop liver cancer. So I think at the end of the day, hep B is an integrated virus, which can induce significant liver injury and cause liver cancer. So the bottom line is more fibrosis you have, likely to develop complications, but never forget we can't fall asleep on hepatitis B. And then there's one more question, um, and um, it was to kind of expand on um, hepatitis B um, and how it can be passed on to the household children um, even after the vaccination um, if the mother is highly viremic. And, and would you treat the mother in that way? And, and so there was a little confusion around that. Yeah, so I, I apologize for the confusion. So if mom is pregnant, the time that the baby is going to get infected is while the baby's in utero or during uh, during delivery. So remember, it was traditionally taught that the baby is going to get infected while they're being delivered, but that's not true. There can be transmission through the uterus. So the baby is at risk during delivery and prior to delivery, which is the reason why you want to do third trimester treatment. The only time I've ever seen like a child get hepatitis B was if they weren't vaccinated and they were exposed in some way. So I had an unfortunate situation where a child was unvaccinated, the mom had hepatitis B, she was a diabetic, the child stuck himself with the needle and got hepatitis B. So the transmission prevention is during the third trimester. That's when we treat the mom to prevent the baby from getting infected. Got it. And then um, somebody wanted to know um, if a patient misses their week four labs or their end of treatment labs, um, what would you do, Mallory or Damaris? So I... I would, if they missed treatment week four or end of treatment, I would just call them and getting blood work at, at any point is fine. Um, really, the main thing is getting that that viral load at post-treatment week 12. 
Um, you know, it's nice to have like viral load at treatment week four end of treatment, but the, the important thing is having it 12 weeks after they complete therapy. Um, like that's the confirmation of cure, but you know, a phone call, there should be a phone call or, or some form of follow-up check-in with the patient just to make sure they're still taking the medication. Um, and you know, they do eventually come in for that, that blood work. It doesn't need to be exactly treatment week four or end of treatment, but like, that's just the, the, the timeline, but you know, we, we could work around it. Damaris, do you have any other comments? Right. No, no, and that, that's true. And Hep C has become very streamlined. It's not the days that we, you know, we had to stop everything and, you know, treat with the uh, epigen or, or, you know, stop therapy or do this, dose reduce. It's, it's very streamlined. It's, it's just not. And then um, Dr. Gaglio, uh, has having hepatitis um, B E antibody, has that been found to be more protective for patients? Yeah, so I answered that in the chat, but I'll answer it again. I mean, I think that E antibody is not protective. There are many older patients with Hep B are E antibody positive. They're actively replicating virus. They're surface antigen positive. So it's all about the surface antigen, the viral load, and the level of fibrosis. Those are the three things we have to be worried about. And of course, assessing for liver cancer. So those are all the questions. There have been a few shout outs to the specialty pharmacists who've been supporting this group. I know uh, Mallory spent some time talking about the importance of plugging the patients in with the proper pharmacy. And, and we're really fortunate to have some of those on here supporting this um, talk as well. So thank you. Um, if there are any further questions, um, you can certainly email them to us and we'll try to answer them in the future. But I, I will turn this over now to Kathy. Thank you so much, Diane. And thanks to everyone who participated in session two of our nurses education series. Everyone who attended today is going to receive an email that will include a link so that you can view this webinar on demand, um, as well as a program survey and an invitation to register for session three of our nurses education series, which will take place on June 2nd. Um, the topic, as you can see, is liver transplant disparities in Black patients. It will feature a presentation by three very talented nurses, also from New York Presbyterian, Columbia Presbyterian Center for Liver Disease and Transplantation. Um, so for more information about hepatitis and other liver-related health topics, I invite you to visit the American Liver Foundation's website, liverfoundation.org. Um, we also invite you to share our website as well as um, our toll-free uh, national helpline with your patients. Um, we have some great resources for them. Um, and please follow ALF on Facebook and YouTube. Um, keep in touch with all of the, the great programs that we have coming up. Thank you so much to today's expert speaker, speakers, Dr. Paul Gaglio, nurse practitioner Damaris Carrero, and registered nurse Mallory Ionelli, and to a, a team of accomplished nurses from the American Liver Foundation's Greater New York, New Jersey Medical Advisory Council, who planned our nurse education series, um, which included today's webinar. Uh, Margie fernandez Sloves, Deborah Gus, Diane lapointe Rudeau, and Alyssa Sajays. Um, a very special thank you to today's sponsors, Biomatrix, Optum RX Pharmacy, and Octopharma USA for their generosity in supporting the American Liver Foundation and this nurse education session, we thank you. The program has now concluded. Thank you to everyone who attended and we hope to see you all at session three on June 2nd.